All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another Friday rambling, and we are going to get into some legal fun, because the entertainment industry loves its lawsuits, and that includes the video game industry. Now, we have done a couple previous videos discussing Nintendo's history of lawsuits and legal settlements. There is the famous... Uh, Nintendo vs. Universal suit dealing with whether or not Donkey Kong was a derivative work of King Kong. And thus, an attempt by Nintendo to skirt getting the license agreements to make a King Kong game. There was the Nintendo vs. Galoob where Nintendo tried to shut down the game Genie the first really big popular uh, cheat device available here in America. Now, there's been a few others over the years, and we're not just picking on Nintendo. In fact, the backstory of this lawsuit involves a few other software publishing companies, but Nintendo... I'm always going to be a fan of Nintendo. I've grown up with Nintendo. I've been playing their systems since the uh, NES. I've played every major hardware release they've put out. So, Nintendo's always going to be a close to my heart. And yes, folks, when I do say every major hardware release, I have played the Virtual Boy. I've never owned it, but I have played it. And that means... I do like stuff involving Nintendo. However, we do want to reiterate, this is not me criticizing Nintendo of any era. This is me simply being honest about Nintendo and the fact that they have done things that, you know, your average person, especially those that honestly are not fans of big business, are going to look at and go like, oh yeah, it's an example of how they're all just about themselves. And one could certainly discuss that. One could certainly take that perspective. But the key of all this, the key of all this, and this goes to the heart of the old Donkey Kong, King Kong one, in which Nintendo was the defendant, because they back then were the small company going up against the big Universal Studios, and the Nintendo Galoob, which is really two big companies, is that it comes down to copyright. And the thing I really want everybody to understand with copyright, when it's all said and done, copyright, while it can be used in civil lawsuits as a way to cause trouble, the important thing you have to understand about copyrights is if a company feels that there has been a violation of copyright, they are basically legally obligated to raise a stink about it. Because the key of copyrights, and this is something that, you know, as somebody that has written a novel and had to double check what copyright protection I could get for it. You know, as just an individual self-publisher, is near and dear to my heart, and that is that. You know, copyright law hinges on the fact that you have to show that you value being recognized as the legal owner of this individual concept, this piece of material, and as such that value has to be shown consistently. If you let one person willingly and consensually use your copyright without proper compensation or permission, if you just kind of go, eh, it's small, it's not worth doing, you open a big whoop loophole for everybody else that wants to mess with your copyrights to just yank them away from you. Now, 
Honestly, I could do a whole thing about that, and one day, I'm probably going to break down and do a video on piracy. It's an extremely complicated issue. Gets into a lot of moral and ethical gray areas. Probably going to have to wait till I can uh, get my partner in crime to get uh, in a place health-wise where he can sit down and have a good long recording session with me about it because you do want to have multiple perspectives on the issue. I don't know. Uh, maybe somebody else wants to come on here and debate with me. That's certainly something I may look to in the future. Might be a good thing for a 2023 topic. We're diverging though. Let's talk about Nintendo and Blockbuster going to war. Because we've had a nice intro and laid out some context for us. Okay. So, in the late 1980s, Video rental shops began to rent computer software to capitalize on the growing software industry. Now, no, we are not simply talking about video games. They were renting all kinds of software for a brief period of time. Because there weren't a lot of laws about what can be legally bought and then rented out to others. Since that's an exchange of money. And the whole rental concept is always hinged on the argument of would this person have bought it outright if they didn't have the option of renting it and thus owning it for a short term. That's always been the core debate of rental places. I know these days it doesn't it's kind of hard to picture because you know we have streaming and digital downloads of everything. But it's still kind of there. Look at Microsoft Office and how much they have moved towards um, yearly subscriptions. In a way, you can argue that this is essentially a long-term rental going with Office 365. But again, I digress. That's another topic for another day. The core of this is that, hey, software was getting rented out and a variety of companies including Microsoft and the WordPerfect Corporation, as well as Nintendo, along with the Software Publishers Association, lobbied the U.S. Congress to limit the rental of software. The Video Software Dealers Association, uh, currently known as the Entertainment Merchants Association, which is a not-for-profit international trade association, um... It, oh, and the Software Publishers Association is currently known as the Software and Information Industry Association. If you would like to look either one of these organizations up for further info on your own, that is the current names you'll find them under. But, as I said, the Video Software Dealers Association, aka Entertainment Merchants Association currently, offered a deal to the software publishers promising to support new rental limits if they still allow the lucrative game cartridge rentals to happen at all. Because Nintendo is somebody who did not want any rentals at all to occur as they very much believe that anybody interested in the game should be buying it outright. Again, Let's put some things in context in timeline placement here. Nintendo in the 80s was not a juggernaut company that they are today. Uh, they had only really been highly successful for uh, several years at this point. There was no guarantees that they would not end up like Atari if bad luck or taking your eye off the ball financially were to occur. Nintendo was still on a little bit of a precarious line. It really wouldn't even be until the 90s until especially Nintendo of America, being a subsidiary branch, would really have that absolute lockdown on their profit margins 
So they were highly concerned in the 80s with the idea of somebody being able to rent a game, play it, return it, and then turn around a, a day or two later and re-rent it instead of just buying the game outright. Just renting it over and over again until they got tired of playing it. This is, again, part of that key debate of rental stuff. And what all of this comes down to. So, Nintendo did manage to get the idea of software rentals limited to a point where various companies could be assured it wouldn't short-term cripple their ability to stay in business. But it was a compromise, and Nintendo of America, eh, like any good compromise, wasn't 100% happy about it. They still didn't want Blockbuster touching any of their games, and thus potential profits. What's a company to do? Congress has already said legally they can still rent the games. Hmm. 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 Oh no. We found another trick. We found another trick. Yes, Nintendo did. You see, an unfortunate thing in the retail industry is that when it comes to video games, a classic thing done was that you would not only get the cartridge, but the instruction manual as well, because you need instructions in order to play the game. This was in the era before uh, in-game tutorials and really detailed menus showing custom button layout, as well as the fact that they would often, in order to cut down on the amount of exposition present in the games, especially because this was before the era of video openings and stuff, giving you the ability to understand everything that's going on, structure bands were the best way to delve into the story as well as show the controls. That's all well and good until somebody rents the game, loses the manual, lets the manual get eaten by their dog, whatever. Trust me folks, it happened back in the day. A couple of games I owned, I lost the manuals to after a while or they would get wrecked. I had one, I had gotten some. I didn't wash my hands after breakfast. I had gotten some syrup on it, so I had a few pages that were just stuck together permanently because of syrup and paper, not a good mixture. It happened. It happened a lot. So what's Blockbuster to do? People want manuals with their games. Okay, no probs. We'll photocopy the manuals. Whoop. Technically, that is illegal. You cannot copy the manuals because manuals are considered part of the commercial product and the deal when you buy the game is you get one copy of the instruction manual. Therefore, making multiple instruction manuals up because the manuals themselves were copyrighted is a violation of copyright. Nintendo's got their loophole. Nintendo can sue Blockbuster LLC, as the company was officially known, outright for doing what they do, which is trying to help out their customers, even if it is technically illegal, these things happen. So what are you gonna do about this? Now, it all comes down to, on July 31st, 1989, Nintendo America sent a letter request to Blockbuster, requesting that Blockbuster cease photocopying and reproducing Nintendo's copyrighted video game manuals. They did not get the immediate response they wanted. This means that Nintendo went ahead and doubled down 
five days later with a formal lawsuit against Blockbuster in the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey, with Nintendo alleging copyright infringement for the unauthorized copying of their game manuals. Nintendo asserted that at least one Blockbuster owned store and three franchises within New Jersey have photocopied their game manuals and rented them to their customers with their respective games. Blockbuster sent out a public release stating that Nintendo initiated the lawsuit out of frustration. And the Nintendo spokesperson responded that in an industry like ours, if you don't have strong copyright laws, you don't have a company, you don't have an industry. Legal scholars noted that if Blockbuster had indeed photocopied the instruction manuals, they would have violated Nintendo's copyright. So, you can see why this is something that needed a judiciary hearing and a resolution reached. Nintendo did have some legal precedent in saying this was a violation of copyright. And Blockbuster did kind of have a point of, dude, it's kind of just something we had to do in the business we're in. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of what happens. One week after the lawsuit commenced, Blockbuster consented to a court order that would suspend the practice photocopying the game manuals. Blockbuster announced they had already contacted store managers to stop copying the manuals when they received Nintendo's original letter. Since video game rentals often led to the loss or damage instruction manuals though, Blockbuster did announce their plans to find a legal alternative to the photocopying. Blockbuster considered either producing their own game manuals or purchasing alternate manuals from an upcoming Video Software Dealers Association convention, finally choosing the latter option, declaring that producing manuals was a waste of resources, considering that video games made up only 3% of their annual profits at this point. You would think everything would be hunky-dory at this point, right? Eh, mostly. By the following year, Nintendo and Blockbuster settled the matter outside of court for an undisclosed amount. Nintendo continued to argue for their inclusion to the Computer Software Rental Amendments Act, which, similar to a lot of Office-based software from Microsoft and the previously mentioned WordPerfect Corporation, yeah, go ahead and ask your grandparents about WordPerfect, you little younger kids. Microsoft Office wasn't always the uh, lone big bad wolf in town when it came to uh, doing your homework or take-home business work. The United States House Judiciary Committee ultimately approved a bill that limited the rental of computer software without limiting the rental of video games. Thus, Nintendo was excluded from the final legislation that protected the more business-oriented software. During the dispute, journalist Jack Neese was famously known for stating that what Blockbuster is doing may be completely legal, but it is not right. Journalist David Sheff also reacted in his book date his book Game Over by comparing games and movies. Film studios have a window of exclusivity in theaters before they decide to offer their work for rental. A similar model would be reasonable for games, rather than allowing video rental stores to buy unlimited copies on the first day of release. In 1993, Nintendo of America Vice President Howard Lincoln criticized the video game rental business, describing Nintendo's business model to spending thousands of hours and millions of dollars creating a game to be compensated every time the thing sells, while lamenting that rental companies can't exploit the thing, running it out over and over again hundreds and even thousands of times without any compensation to Nintendo or their developers. So... The good news is, unlike the previous lawsuits we discussed, this was settled reasonably uh, peacefully between the two companies, although Nintendo would continue to, in their intervening years, publicly demean the concept of game rentals and companies that decided to use game rentals as a part of their business. I'm not going to lie, I rented a lot of games in my youth, and I'm kind of glad I did because some of them really weren't worth playing more than once. But again, as a youth, I didn't understand law. Now, again, the debate of is Nintendo ethically and morally correct in that 
They're software that they created with the intent to be purchased by the individual consumer should not be rented out. Creating a model where Nintendo only gets paid for the game once, but the rental company gets to make money off of it over and 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 Again, moral, ethical, legally it is permissible. Ultimately, this is a concept that would be recycled over again with the rise of used game stores, most famously GameStop. Again, legally permissible to resell used games. Actually, probably a little closer to what Nintendo would prefer in the sense of the individual consumer who originally bought the game no longer has the option of doing anything with the game because they do not have possession of it. Whereas rental companies, after X amount of rental days, get the game back. Still a discouragement from a lot of publishers in purchasing used games, but secondhand goods are a thing across many industries. You're not getting rid of it too easily. Now the long-term impact of this is that Nintendo then turned its attention to counterfeit games, as well as various uh, other aspects that were cutting into their profits, including companies that continued to try to work around Nintendo's exclusivity deals with publishers, the infamous Tengen lawsuit, which is definitely going to be covered because Tengen is Atari. And that is fun times. Once all said and done, though, Nintendo and Blockbuster did manage to repair their business relationship after the lawsuit, collaborating throughout the 90s and early 2000s, including Nintendo um, allowing Blockbuster to rent and sell a number of games made exclusive to the rental company stores, as well as Blockbuster's hosting various uh, officially licensed video game tournaments featuring Nintendo games being played. The case has been noted as one of the lawsuits that altered the course of the game industry, allowing the rental market to thrive for the years that followed. As the game industry came to accept video game rentals, companies did focus more on the economic threat of used game sales and really moreover you could say that and again, that is another big kettle of fish because you get into digital rights management, the various things individual publishers have done to try to undermine used games. That is, whew, that goes deep. But the important thing for Nintendo is that their company did continue to thrive. They did manage to keep a generally good public image because they did make peace with Blockbuster. And... Ultimately, the idea of, the, of accepting the concept of game renting can be shown in modern times with downloadable game demos, which are a major part of both current Nintendo business model as well as their main competitors in the Xbox and PlayStation. I hope you enjoyed this legal breakdown. Feel free to look into, as I said, any of these topics we discuss more as well as the various companies or organizations that were involved on one level or another with this. As for me, I will be back in seven days to ramble some more as we have many more topics to discuss. Every seven days, we break it down, we discuss something that is entertaining without getting too hateful. We don't judge here at Roulette Productions. We just lay out the facts. Be good to each other. Be good to yourselves. And take it easy.